Good evening, everybody. Um, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to this James Gear Memorial Lecture. Um, this is my last official duty as chairman of the PRF because after this evening, I'm handing over the chairmanship to Dale Wood, who was elected by the board to succeed me as chairman of the PRF. Um, but it is a real pleasure for me to do this this evening and to th uh, thank you for coming to this lecture. The James Gear Memorial Lecture is really a flagship event in our calendar every year. And we have been privileged over many years now to have had some really fine and interesting lectures delivered to us by prominent people from the field of virology. And I'm quite sure that this evening will be no exception and that it will be a really fantastic lecture for us all. Um, I therefore invite Car Professor Caroline Timerson to introduce our, our guest lecturer this evening, Professor Helen Rees. Caroline. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I have a great honour of um, introducing Professor Helen Rees, who is an internationally recognised as an award-winning global health and medical practitioner and has dedicated her professional to improving public health in Africa. Um, she is the founder and the executive director of the Wits Reproductive Health Institute. This is the largest research institute at Wits University in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, a medical doctor by profession, uh, she is a personal professor in the University of the Advantasrans Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, co-director of the Wits African Leadership in Vaccinology Expertise, honorary professor in the Department of Clinical Research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and an honorary fellow at the Murray Edwards College, Cambridge University of the UK. She also holds a um, Doctor of Science uh, Medicine um, from the University of London and a Doctor of Law uh, from the University of um, uh, Rhodes University. She served on many national and global scientific uh, committees and boards, and the, the list is endless. Um, she is the board chair of the South African Health um, Products Regulation Authority. She, she chairs the WHO African Regional Technical Advisory Group on Immunization. For the past 15 years, she's played a major role on global vaccine uh, committees. She has contributed to the evolution of HIV and STI vaccine research through chairing and the membership of WHO and UNAIDS expert committees. Um, combining her interests, she has been PI and co-investigator on a number of HPV, human papilloma virus vaccine studies. She chairs a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Committee on HPV vaccines and is a member of the WHO HPV Vaccine Expert Committee and chairs the South African um, National Advisory uh, Committee on Immunizations HPV Technical Working Group. She is co-chair on two studies exploring H HPV vaccine impact among girls in communities with high HIV prevalence and on the effectiveness of single-dose HPV vac vaccines. She's the chair of the um, Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization um, Investment Strategy that is developing a priority list for the procurement of vaccines between 2025 to 2030 for the world's poorest 71 countries. She chairs the Med Access Board, which is the global organization that identifies and funds access to neglected therapeutics and diagnostics required in low and middle income countries. She's won many international and national awards for her contribution to global health and to science, including being made an officer of the British Empire in 2001 by Queen Elizabeth II. In 2016, she was awarded the South African National Order of the Baobab for her contribution to medicine and to medical research. In 2022, Prof. Reese was made an officer of the French National Order of Merit by President Macron for her contribution to global health and to the COVID vaccine response or to the COVID response, and also received the Platinum South African National um, Bathu Pele Award for excellence in contribution to the South African COVID-19 response. 
In 2022, she was named a standout voice in public and in African public health by Harvard Public Health. So kind of in summary, um, Prof. Helen Rees is widely respected for her ability to synthesize recommendations from multifaceted inputs um, to, link, uh, and to, um, to link research and to policy and has successfully chaired many national, regional and global committees in deliberations that have changed key strategies and in policies in the African region and has served on expert structures and committees for WHO, UNAIDS, UNICEF, and the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, I think um, the can only person giving this, uh, this particular public lecture, um, which is entitled Cancer, um, Cervical Cancer Elimination, give us the tools and we will finish the job. Um, I like the fighting talk. <laughs> and... Uh, um, I give the floor to uh, Professor Helen Reese for the, the public lecture. Thank you, Helen. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Try again. Can you hear me? Yes. I, there's a whistle. We are going to be okay? We're whistling. Quickly. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, Caroline. That was um, I, 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 she showed me the, the this big sheet of paper, and I said, "Just no, cut it down. That's fine. We'll we'll get on with it." Uh, but I just want to say thank you very much for this invitation to give this lecture because um, I'd heard of this lecture before previously, um, but it was a huge honour to be asked. Uh, I think it was. Barry, Lucille, I'm not sure who else had a hand in this invitation, but thank you very, very much. Um, and I was told that it's going, to, it has to be a lecture that engages people both from a lay perspective and a technical perspective. So no pressure. There's also no time limit on this lecture, so <laughs> no pressure on you. Um, so I'd, so just to, to move on, uh, next slide. We are also having to do a bit of dancing between the computers. I just wanted to recognize also James Gear. There was a slide up previously. Well, when I read his bio, it really struck me that he was probably one of he, the sort of early, we didn't talk about them then, but a global health practitioner. He served on lots of WHO committees of all sorts, and he had a huge impact. And he developed one of the early polio vaccines, as we well know, which is why we're here. So I think it is truly uh, an honor to be uh, giving a lecture uh, that reflects his contributions. But I want to just recognize somebody else, and I'm not sure if she'll be online. And this is, some of you might know her, Professor Lynn Denny from UCT. She is outstanding, and I spoke to, and she's retiring, um, and I spoke to uh, the Witz of Zangani department. She's a Ghani oncologist, and I got quotes from Trudy Smith and Longanani and Bodhi, um, really saying uh, the quotes, oh, it would help if I did that. Oh, no, you know what? I'm ahead. You're catching up. You, <laughs> just if I'm talking and you can't see the slide, tell us because we're trying to communicate with each other. Oh, you're right. Okay, thanks. So these are quotes from two of her good colleagues as she retires. She is somebody who in this country also has, she's made a huge impact in terms of HPV research, gynaeoncology, and cancer of the cervix responses. Um, and she really is an extraordinary uh, clinician, has also won a national award for her contribution. So I wanted to take this opportunity, having seen her recently at a conference, uh, to just take a, to salute her as well. I think it's nice to salute our women scientists as well in this context. So Lynn, if you're online, and I hope you are, this, that was for you, and this is comments from your colleagues. Next slide. So this is a quote from William Wordsworth. Life is divided into three terms, that which was, which is, and which will be. Let us learn from the past to profit by the present, and from the present to live better in the future. It's quite a nice quote. And I'm going to go past, present, and future in this talk. Next slide. So I looked at this book. Uh, and I read this book, which was fascinating. It's a good piece of uh, history of medicine, which looked at the history of cervical cancer. 
Um, and it took us through, took us, took the book took me through the whole history from when it was first mentioned. Next slide. And this is when it was first mentioned, 17,000 BC, uh, when an Egyptian papyrus was noted to be referring to what was thought to be some sort of tumor. Um, Hippocrates also alluded to uterine tumors. And as you moved on, you can see at the beginning of the ADs, the early speculum was developed. Moving on still, as you got further into the ADs and the Romans, they started to actually develop uh, surgical treatments. Um, and again, the speculum continued to be developed throughout the 16th century. And in the 18th century, there was a, a, a paper written which divided infection from tumors, which was the beginning of that sort of thinking. But early sufferers, it was described as a fate worse than death. And there are two that were referred to. Um, Ada Lovelace, who was Lord Byron's daughter, was apparently probably one of the earliest computer program programmers there was, but she got cancer of the cervix. And her treatment included, as you can see there, opium, mesmerism, cannabis, and chloroform. But she had severe pain and convulsions. And then Eva Peron, who you all know is the first lady of Argentina, also had cancer of the cervix. She was treated with hysterectomy and radiotherapy and heavy, heavy doses of morphine, even as she ap appeared in public. Next slide. So the, there were early theories, and I'm going to just show you this. It's quite interesting because this is from the 19th century, the early 19th century. And here are three quotes from three different scientists then. The cancerous virus is produced at the site of development of this disease and infects the whole system only when carried through the circulation. A second quote, an accurate diagnosis of this disease in its early stages would be most desirable, but from the nature of it and the organ it involves, seldom opportunity of examining in this period. And a third quote, because of their praiseworthy modesty, they, that's being women, consult too late. So just think about that, and I'll unpack this a little bit. So were they right? They were right. The cancerous virus is produced at the site of development of this disease. As we'll see, HPV came much later, but they had thought about it at the beginning of the 19th century. An accurate diagnosis of the disease in its early stages would be most desirable. We have spent billions and billions of, of dollars on research into accurate and early diagnosis. And because they consult too late is something that uh, we, particularly in this region, are suffering from, and I'll talk about that. So early treatment, as you saw uh, from Ada Lovelace, was pretty awful. If you look at that, hemlock, strychnine, lead, and hot, uh, red hot irons were some of the early treatments. Then, as the newer speculums were, de were developed in the middle of the 19th century, they were only used to diagnose venereal diseases in prostitutes, but rarely for honest women. So it was a stigmatized problem. Um, they started to, to do surgery in the 18th and 19th century, but the, the excision of the cervix and the hysterectomy, then more women died from those interventions than would have died of the disease. But the French Academy of Medicine in 1899 said it's better to die under the knife than to face the natural and absolute end. This was a dreadful disease to live through if, if without any treatment. And at the end of the 19th century came the microscope. Into the 20th century and radiotherapy, using radium therapy was introduced and there was staging of tumors, which we still use today and which allows us to think about what's appropriate treatment. Radiation combined with surgery, they then came in with very good impact. And then it was recognized that you could use radiation alone without surgery for early lesions. But the high radiation that was from the early days in itself caused a lot of damage such as fistula. And of course, then moved on surgically to vaginal hysterectomies and radical abdominal hysterectomies. There were innovations in diagnosis and prevention. In 1924, Hinselman in Hamburg, um, he spent his life developing the col colposcope, which is essentially a microscope and a light so that you can magnify the cervix and have a look at it. Um, in the same sort of period, um, someone called Schiller from Vienna worked out that carcinomatous cells didn't contain glycogen. So if you put iodine on them, they wouldn't stain. 
And later on, it was also recognized as you apply acetic acid to a cervix that has got uh, early cancer or later cancerous changes, you see white and aceto white staining. Um, and then it was understood that those abnormal cells can signify more uh, invasive cancers. So this was sort of from the middle of the 20th century. And then the one that you will all know, which is George Papanicola and the pap smear. You're all familiar with this. He published his first paper in the 1920s saying that he thought that if you could to get a vaginal fluid, that you could detect cancer in the cervix. Um, but it didn't get any traction for 20 years until he'd finally showed that indeed you could, that if you took a microscope and you looked at the, can the cells that you could differentiate between normal and malignant cells. And that led to the pap smear, which we're still using today, which is inexpensive and easy to use, but has shortcomings because it involves laboratories and follow-up. That meant that in countries such as the UK, this is an article from The Lancet, in 1988, they introduced screening. Now, if you look at this graph here, you can see that actually the death rate if you were born in 1922 from cancer of the cervix was the yellow line. If you were born in 1952, it was the red line at the bottom. It's not a yellow line, it's a red line, isn't it? Two red lines, right. Um, and what they, they estimated is that one in 80 of the 8 million British women who are born between 1951 and 1970 had their lives saved because of screening. So that screening tool has saved millions and millions of lives. But it's not appropriate in many low middle income countries because it involves the laboratory. And so because of this, in the beginnings of the 2000s, there was huge interest and enthusiasm for low middle income countries for um, what's called visual inspection with the acetic acid. Um, it was recognized that um, when, when this really started to catch on, that only around 5% of eligible women would undergo uh, cytology screening in low middle income countries. Uh, at, at, over a five-year period. And so it's not an appropriate technology. We have the same problem in South Africa. So, they, so this was introduced, DIA as it's called, and it's the naked eye and it's acetic acid and it's a speculum and you can look and you can see if there are white patches and then you can have a flow chart which tells you what you do next and I'll come back to that later. But it can mean that you can have a, a diagnosis and treatment on the same day. And this was, of course, the huge breakthrough that we'll talk much more about. And this was from Harold, Harold Zurhausen, who got the Nobel Prize for this, because he recognized that HPV was associated with cancer of the cervix. And in 1983, he published a paper showing that it was particularly HPV types 16 and 18 that were strongly associated with cervical cancer and changes in the cells. So this is the human papillomavirus. Uh, it's, it's a small non-enveloped virus with double-stranded DNA genome. It's got, there are over 150 strains and 40 are anogenital. There are 12 what we call high-risk or oncogenic types. These are the HPV types of those 150 plus minus types. These are the 12 that are associated with cancer um, of, of different descriptions. If you look at this graph here on the right in the red, I hope I got the colors right this time, that's women and the blue are the men. And you can see the, um, the burden of cancers with breast cancer at the top being the commonest. Um, cervical cancer is the most, is the second most cancer, second most common cancer in the African region after breast. And it's the fourth amongst women worldwide. But if you look at those red arrows, you can see all the other um, uh, cancers that are HPV related. So it's not just cancer of the cervix, but if you look at that burden, it's by far the biggest burden. Cancer of the cervix is an HPV related uh, cancer. That is the biggest burden. If we look a little bit more closely in the next slide here, <clears throat> you can see that uh, in this study here, which was which is a global estimate from Globacan, which is an online um, setup that collects cancer data and analyzes it. What you can see is that uh, it, the, it, the, there's cancer of the cervix, anus, vulva, vagina, penis, and oropharynx that are listed here. And then if you look at the attributable fraction, the AF percentage, 
Cancer of the cervix, 100% of those cancers of the cervix are attributable to HPV. When you come down and look at anus, it's 88%, vagina, 78%, and lower as you go into the oropharynx. But what we are seeing worldwide is possibly an increase in oropharyngeal cancers, probably associated with HPV. Next slide. But let's come back to cervical cancer. So taking it even further, as I said, right at the beginning when this, this discovery was made, it was seen that HPV 16 and 18 are the two most important HPV types associated with cancer of the cervix. They, are, they account for about 70% of cervical cancers. But you can see again, as you go down, there are other oncogenic types that are responsible for the smaller percentages of cancers of the cervix. And this is important to understand when you're making vaccines. Because if you, the, the, when you start making a vaccine, you have to say, what am I trying to protect from? You've got 12 oncogenic types. What are the most important? If 70% are 16 and 18, my early vaccines must protect against 16 and 18. So to understand how to use things like vaccines and how to do prevention, you have to understand the natural history of HPV infection and cancer of the cervix. HPV infection is one of the earliest sexually transmitted infections, occurs very soon after sexual activity starts. And that means that it's most common in adolescents less than 30 years, but the peak infection time is between 20 to 24 years. And you can see in the blue curve there that, uh, that with the age group underneath, you can see the peak of HPV infection. And it, it, most of these infections are spontaneously cleared, and it can take about eight months to clear. But for persistent infection, if you see that blue line at the top, it says viral persistence and progression. Some of them don't clear, and it's those that we worry about. And there are risk factors that are associated with not clearing, things like smoking, but also immunocompromise and HIV. And I'll show you a, a, a slide later on HIV. <clears throat> so you have an HPV infection and what happens? Well, the HPV infection, and this is what was seen early on, it gets incorporated into the epithelial cells of the cervix. And then the precancerous lesions are divided into three parts called CIN, uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And CIN1 is just at the beginning. If you look at the spotted diagram on the right-hand side with the red boxes at the top, this is where you start to get uh, changes in the epithelium, but it's about the lower one third of the epithelium that's changes. But once you get to CIN2 and 3, you can see that the, the cells change progressively and you will eventually, if that progresses, you will get invasive carcinoma. CIN1, um, about 60% of these also can regress to normal uh, after about one year. So you have uh, both HPV can infect clear up spontaneously, can cause CIN, then the CIN can regress or can progress, and that will lead to, to cancers. And then the cancers themselves are here, and they are staged, as I said. And this happened, staging happened very early, but now the staging is used very extensively as, as treatment is considered. Stage one, two, three, and four, and obviously the stage one is the early stage before you've got spread beyond the cervix, and then you get spread beyond the cervix, and then you get spread into the pelvis, and finally, you get disseminated spread. So there you are. That's, that's cancer of the cervix. That's the history, and that's where we are. But now, where are we now? Because we've got the pap smears, we've got treatments. So where are we now? What's the latest data? Well, we're not doing terribly well. This is data from WHO looking at the numbers of women who died <clears throat> in 2020 from cancer of the cervix. And as you can see, the dark red is not good news, and that's the African region. So cancer of the cervix is a leading cause of cancer deaths amongst women in low middle income countries. You can also see big countries like India and so on, but the, the African region is really has very high mortality. If we looked at the incidence, that's a number of new, new uh, um, diagnoses of, of cancers of the cervix, um, you can again see that the African region has got a huge burden of disease. And more than th this, we had about over 350, we had about 350,000 deaths. We've got about six, 600,000 cases um, annually. 
Um, and over 90% of these deaths and cases are occurring in low middle income countries. So it's the poverty related issue and it's an access to services related issue. So this is just looking at the poverty. This is looking at mortality rates. And um, on the right hand side, the tall bar that you see is the lowest income countries and the dark bar on the left is high income countries. And you can see that mortality is completely determined by socio-demographic distribution. And that is not only access to screening, but is also access to treatment. To compound our difficulties, this is what we're also living with in this region. And this is a, a much higher burden of um, uh, cancer of the cervix for women living with HIV. Again, you can see that map with the bright red showing this, this increased burden, but the risk for developing cancer of the cervix is six times higher if you're living with HIV than if you're not. There's a higher risk also of HPV infection and also a higher risk of more HPV types infecting you. There's a lower chance that you're going to clear that infection. Remember, a lot of women will clear it, lower chance to clear. There's faster progression to those precancerous lesions. There's lower progression of those precancerous lesions. There's higher recurrence following treatment and a younger age at presentation. And so we have a double whammy here because we've got the HPV and we've got HIV. So how are we doing with the screening that we said is so important? And <laughs> once again, look at the African region, all the reds, the screening. Next slide. That's it. The screening, as you can see, is, uh, is again, much, much lower coverage in the African region. So the coverage of less than 70% is 63% of the countries. Um, so the coverage in, is, is lowest in the countries and in the regions where the burden of disease is highest. So we're not managing to screen using those existing tools. So in response to this, the World Health Organization approved in 2020 a global strategy to accelerate cervical cancer elimination. And they've defined this as less than four cases per 100,000 women per year. And they've got three targets here, the 90, 70, 90. You know, global health loves targets, you know. We have uh, 95, 95, 95 for HIV. I'm sure there's, then there's TB targets, measles targets. We love targets. But the 90% is by 2030 of girls fully vaccinated with HPV vaccines by the age of 15 years. 70% of women are screened with a high performance test by 35 years of age and again by 45 years of age. And 90% of women are identified with cervical disease, receive treatment. 90% of women with precancers treated and 90% of women with invasive cancers also managed. So if we look at, really look at this continuum and now I'm going to break it down and say, where are we and what can we do? We've got primary prevention, which are the vaccines. We've got secondary prevention, which is for the precancers or the newly diagnosed cancers, where you've got second screening and secondary prevention as your tool. And tertiary prevention, when you've got established cancers, which is treatment and supportive care. So coming back to the 90, 70, 90, the 90% 90 vaccinated, how are we doing with this? And what do we know about the vaccines? Are you keeping up with me? You're okay? Yeah. <laughs> so the HPV vaccination is a really good vaccine. It's an excellent vaccine. Um, and it strongly reduces invasive cancer of the cervix amongst girl when girls are vaccinated, particularly at a younger age. This is data from the UK that I'm showing you here. It, as you can see, and this is looking at uh, uh, protection against cancer of the cervix, as you can see that the earlier you give the vaccine to girls, the more protective it is. And these are the amount, this is the estimated relative reduction in cancer of the cervix um, following vaccination. So if you, if you give 12 to 13 year olds, you'll get an 87% reduction. 14 to 60 year olds, 16 year olds, you'll get 62%. And 16 to 8 year olds, you'll get 34%. And the reason is, as you get older, those girls have already been exposed to HPV. So your vaccine is not going to be as effective as those age groups. But you can see that this is a truly effective vaccine, and it's been shown in the similar way in Sweden and, and Denmark. There are four, at the moment, four HPV vaccines that are what are called WHO pre-qualified. That means that the World Health Organization has approved these vaccines for, for use. 
And it's a bit like a, a, a sort of global regulatory authority, if you like. And many of these vaccines have also been approved in countries. Uh, but you can see in the top line there that the vaccines uh, cover different HPV types. And of the four that you're seeing here, one is a quadrivalent, which covers 6, 11, 16, and 18. The next one is bivalent, 16 and 18. The next one is the nine valent. And those nine valent, apart from six and 11, are all oncogenic. They all cause cancers. So seven of those nine cause cancers. And then another bivalent. They're all, in the next row down, highly effective uh, vaccines, 95% plus. It's a very effective vaccine with very few side effects. So how are we doing with introducing? It's one thing to have the tools. You know, the, the title was give us the tools and we'll do the job. It's one thing to have the tools, but how are we doing it? You can see that the first thing is that COVID really hit this program very hard. Um, if you look at the 2021 data, only 107 countries had introduced and we can put it up to 130. But again, look at the African region. In the light green that you're seeing there, these are the countries that have not yet introduced. But the other problem we're seeing is that the schedule, which I'll talk about later, is two doses. That was two doses. And what we're seeing in many of these countries that are introduced is you'll get, and, and in South Africa the same, you'll get high, uh, higher coverage with your first dose, but you won't get the coverage with your second dose. And the problem of, 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 of what we're seeing is once again, it's the poverty factor that we're seeing that those living in uh, the lower income countries are much less likely to be covered. So if you see the um, high income countries in the dark blue, you can see the coverage there is up to 70%. But once you come down to the lower income countries, it falls apart from those that are supported by a global initiative called Gavi, which helps poor countries buy vaccines. But the problem is even though 129 countries have introduced the vaccine, and 65 have not. That 65 represents 68% of the eligible population who should be receiving the vaccine. So the majority of girls in the areas where the burden of disease is greater are not getting the vaccines. And in the African region, um, where we got this goal of 2030 of 90%, we've only reached 33% of rollout for the HPV vaccine. There are many problems. You've got to integrate these programs into schools, and that's hard. Most countries don't have a school vaccine program. You've got to pay for all of this. You've got to uh, do monitoring and evaluation. And then you've got to engage communities. And this has been one of the problems with HPV vaccines is what are you telling people this vaccine is for? Is it to stop cancer? Or is it to stop a sexually transmitted infection? And when do I get it? It's not like measles. I'm protecting your under five child now. I'm saying I'm stopping your daughter getting something in 40 years time. Very difficult to communicate. Um, and then the second dose problem, chasing those defaulters has been hugely difficult. Um, and there's hesitancy challenges, which we also saw, of course, with COVID vaccines as well. When you think about vaccines, you also have to think about vaccine supply. And if you look on the left, you can see in the brown, these were, when we first introduced the vaccines, we simply didn't have enough vaccines for the low middle income countries, they were not available. And does that remind you of anything, COVID? Yeah, it's the same story. Every time we have vaccines, they'll go to the rich world first where the need is least, they'll come to us later. And we're hoping that with, there are four new manufacturers coming through and we're hoping that, the, that we will get more vaccines. But the vaccine we really want is that nine valent. Remember our HIV load, they're more likely to have more HPV types. The nine valent is prohibitively expensive. Remember COVID, prohibitively expensive. It's very resonant, unfortunately. And one of the problems we're seeing in terms of vaccine price, you can see that the vaccine price on the right-hand side there for the high-income countries is much higher. But the problem is Gavi is supporting the lower 71 countries to buy vaccines, can drive down the price. The high-income countries can afford to, to pay these high prices. The middle-income countries are caught by themselves. They have to fund it themselves. And now with financing, this is a real challenge. And then, as I said, you've got to think about whether you've got a demand for this vaccine as well. And on the left-hand side first with this map, these were, this was a Lancet article that looked globally at vaccine hesitancy. 
And they asked the question between 2015 at the top and 2018, they asked people, are vaccines safe? And then are vaccines important? And are vaccines effective? And blue is, is good news and red is bad news. And interestingly, in our region, uh, a lot of people think that they are safe, that they're important, and that they can be effective. Now, this study was done and reflects pre-COVID. It would be interesting to see what the impact of that is now. Um, but similarly, we had a study that was done in South Africa, um, and they found that there is a, there was a quite a large anti-vaccine sentiment towards HPV vaccines because of online sources and misinformation and disinformation and concerns about safety. And I think the other thing we often don't think about when we're introducing a vaccine and new technology is what's the role of the media? This was just one study done in 2009 where they looked at the role of the media. It was done in the US and they looked at news stories uh, around HPV and around vaccine use and around cancer of the cervix. But a large number of them didn't mention HPV being a sexually transmitted infection. So you're getting this vaccine and the journalists aren't telling you where you're getting it from. Um, they left out information about the fact you still needed to have cancer of the cervix screening. Um, and they also, uh, they also didn't try and counter misinformation and disinformation. We could say the same for COVID vaccines. And in the future, we're going to have to think much more about proactive uh, communication. Now, one of the big breakthroughs here, I told you that we're having real trouble doing two vaccines. Um, and the second vaccine is very hard. Um, and it's a very good, these are very good vaccines. So we started with a three dose schedule in 2006, and then we went down because it, we found that it was effective two dose schedule. And then we said, can we do a one dose schedule? And a whole lot of research was done on the one dose schedule and I'll summarize in the next slide, but the, the single dose schedule, can you imagine if we could recommend a single dose schedule, it's easier. You only go once. You can go into schools, you can go for children out of schools. You can introduce it to boys if you want. The opportunity to get your coverage up is much, much, much greater. So WHO has now recommended that you can still use two doses if you want, but you can use one dose. Um, and I was at a meeting last week in the region where we are going to recommend that uh, to African countries that they should really consider one dose. And there were lots of studies. When you make a recommendation like this to move a schedule of a vaccine and drop a vaccine, out, you've got to have good data because you, you've got to know what you're doing and, and you can't mislead the public. So there were many studies that showed that a single dose is highly effective. And the good news was that quite a lot of these studies were done in places like Kenya, Tanzania and South Africa um, and India and Costa Rica. And those studies showed several things. One is that one dose is highly effective in preventing persistent HPV infections, that large community studies in India and Costa Rica showed that, uh, that, that one dose was as good as three doses, and that the protection continued for 10 to 15 years. We have done a study in the Free State where we looked at girls who received it through the schools program a single dose, and then we gave a single dose to older girls who had not received it. And we found that the single dose was highly effective in protecting against 1680, including in girls who became HIV positive. So remember that HIV data I showed you? That's hugely important. We can't just go down to one dose and then sort of find that it doesn't work in that population. Um, and then we're looking, there are other studies that are looking at bringing the age group down below nine years, which is the current cutoff, to the five to nine-year-old age group. And other studies that are looking at is that can you use one dose of the nine valent similarly? Um, and similarly, in that last point, one dose has been shown to be good for boys as well as girls. So a lot of countries now are moving towards a one dose policy. Um, and these include high income countries because it looks like it works. So England and Australia and Ireland have already changed. A lot of middle income countries are changing. South Africa, the, the, the NAGI, the NITAG, is now looking at a, a recommendation around this. Um, and a lot of the African countries, as I say from last week's meeting, are also thinking of going to a single dose to increase coverage. And there's been a lot of work on modeling to say, if you increase coverage with one dose, would it work and would it be cost effective and how does that work? And this is just one of those models. And when you have a model like this, 
what you have to say is what are your assumptions about giving two doses and one dose? And in this model here, the assumption was that one dose won't be as good as two doses, that it'll only be 85% effective, whereas two doses will be 100% effective. And that means that the 85% effective can wane over time. And they had three assumptions in this model, which is it wanes over 10 years, it wanes over 20 years, or it doesn't wane at all. But what they found was the key message here was that one dose is cost-saving, kind of makes sense, um, compared to no vaccination, and it could be cost-effective compared to two doses, um, provided that that protection is, is long-standing. So one of the studies we will have to keep doing is looking at for how long will one dose protect. So then the, the, the next thing is the 70% screening. And where are we with screening? Next slide. So there are different approaches to screening worldwide. The dark blue is HPV screening, which I'll explain to you. The light blue is cytology. And the orange is that VIA. Remember the visual inspection with acetic acid, it goes a bit white. And that's what a lot of lower income countries are doing. And 69% of countries do have a screening program of some type. But as I said, the coverage is very weak. So WHO has now changed its recommendations for screening. And they've updated them. And they're talking now about what's called screen and treat. They recognize that in low middle income countries, a lot of them have adopted that VIA because it's cost effective. You can do it in a primary care setting. You can put acetic acid on, have a look and see if there's abnormal look. Um, they also recognize that cytology is not working in our settings. So they're saying now, well, let's move to the next thing in screening, which is HPV screening. And they're moving to HPV screening, which is meant to, which is, has been shown to be highly effective. And this is now testing, before you do anything else, have you got, has a woman got any of those high risk oncogenic HPV types? If they test positive, then a whole algorithm comes in. You can either test and treat straight away, or you can do further investigations. This is from the International Papilloma Virus um, uh, Society, who are strongly recommending HPV testing now as taking over from cytology, that pap smear, as the primary screening. And they're saying this is a very simple thing. And not only that, but women can take the sample themselves. And if you take the sample yourself, you save time of nurses, and, it, uh, and women quite like it. A lot of the studies have shown that women actually like to do this. But the problem with the HPV test, yet again, guess, cost. Very, very expensive, available now in high-income countries. It's going to be a long time before we can afford it here. Next slide. So WHO is recommending that we use HPV for screening at the top there, both for the normal population and for women living with HIV. So we use the HPV test as the first screen. And if it's positive uh, in the general population, you screen and treat, and you do it on the same day. That's the ideal in a primary care setting. And you do what's called ablation, cervical ablation, which you can teach nurses to do very easily. Um, but the alternative, if you're HIV positive is, and you have a, an HPV positive test, is then you do other tests. You do more because you then say, I'm very worried because of your HIV status, that you could have invasive cancer because you've got these high risk types. So then you can do colposcopy and you can do other sorts of tests which are called triaging and get a more detailed diagnosis and proceed. And they tried this out in Papua New Guinea. They did, they did point of care HPV DNA, DNA testing. Taken, the swabs were taken, some of the swabs were taken by the women themselves, some were taken by the clinic and they looked at, and then they did test, they did test and treat. And if you had a positive test for one of those high risk HPV types, you were treated in the primary care clinic. They had a huge benefit in terms of uptake and treatment. And South Africa is going in the same direction. We haven't introduced this yet, and it's too detailed to go into. But what we are going to be recommending is similarly moving away from cytology as the primary test to HPV testing first, and then triaging after that and ending up with treatment. So the last one is this 90% treatment. And where are we? Because as you can imagine, with the numbers of doctors per 100,000 population we have in this region, we are not going to have the same levels of treatment as in high-income countries. 
So there are all sorts of initiatives that are underway to try and scale up surgical oncology interventions. Um, and this is a recommendation from WHO talking about the fact that you can cure early stage cancers if you have enough staff, but we don't have enough skilled providers to be able to do it. And this is hugely discouraging for people working in oncology, for patients and so on. So there's a, one, there are several initiatives. I'm just giving you one example um, from the International Gynecological Cancer Society, which has developed uh, gynae oncology fellowships where they are remotely training and on-site training uh, surgeons in uh, our settings in low middle income countries. So they can actually deliver treatment uh, for both early cancers and more advanced cancers. And the last thing on treatment, and I think this is an important thing for everyone here to think about, this is about the drugs that you need for cancers. Because if I put my SAPRA hat on for one minute, one of the commonest requests we are getting is from uh, patients who are receiving cancer chemotherapy saying, I can't afford to buy it in this country. Uh, if I go to India, I can get it much cheaper. Please can I import it? And we're trying to see if there's a way we can allow that to happen within the confines of the legislation. These drugs, these new drugs are highly effective for many of the cancers, but they're too expensive in our settings. And they can be got cheaper for some products. And we're going to see the same thing. So access to medicines, that little bullet there, in, is a key priority for countries. So I think watch that space, not only for cancer of the cervix, but for all cancer therapies. So the last thing is that this strategy for elimination also calls for uh, innovations. And one of the innovations I'm going to just mention is therapeutic HPV vaccines. So what we've been talking about all this time are the preventive vaccines, the ones that stop you getting HPV infection. This is now saying, if you have an HPV infection, or you have that early precancer, can we give you a vaccine that will actually make it regress? And there are serious studies that are going on looking at whether a vaccine uh, can work for precancers or whether vaccines can reverse HPV infections. And there are phase one, two, and three clinical trials underway now. And importantly, without worrying too much about the detail, if you see the HPV genome organization on the left, you can see the part of the genome that's, uh, that's, that's being targeted by the prophylactic vaccines. The therapeutic vaccines are targeting a different part of the virus. So they are, they are actually looking at different things. So a, a lot of people say, well, can't we just use those prophylactic vaccines? They don't work. They won't, they won't do very much of reversing HPV infection. And there's modeling that's also being done to say, if we had therapeutic vaccines, would they be beneficial? Um, and that you'd have to give them as mass vaccination in age groups, as you can see from that graph below. Um, and if you gave them a mass vaccination in age groups, you would actually reduce cancers of the cervix, even with everything else in place, because not everybody at the moment in, in, here will have, had a, will have had the opportunity for an HPV vaccine. Many women are just too old. So you need to, to see what you can do with a therapeutic vaccine. And they think that perhaps as much from modeling, 15 to 25% additional ca cases of cancer of the cervix can be reduced. So last points are, it's very important to have political will with all of these things, it's incredibly important. Um, on the left is uh, Minister Aaron Watson-Ledi, who was then health minister, administering the first um, HPV vaccine. He's a doctor, just we reassure ourselves. And then Minister Joe Patla, who's a strong supporter of this. Uh, the First Lady, Tsepo Motsepe, who's also been a very strong supporter, and since she's also a medical doctor. And then, obviously, uh, the DG of WHO, uh, Tedros, he's the one that came up with the cervical elimination strategy. And on the right, you might not recognize her, that's Jill Biden, who's also become very outspoken. But uh, the, the family on the right at the top will have been identified as ambassadors, and they are um, relatives, the, 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 son, the, the, the sons and the granddaughters of Henrietta Lacks. Um, and I'll leave you with this thought. Some of you might be familiar with this story. So Henrietta Lacks uh, was an African-American woman and she died of cancer of the cervix in 1951, age 31. And she was not told and never, never gave consent that the tumor cells uh, would be removed from her and would be used in the laboratory. 
Um, and the fact that she never gave consent and these were removed and used in the laboratory was one of the things that drove a bigger focus on medical ethics. Um, the cells they took have now become, are now known, and many of you here are scientists, are HeLa cells. And these are the, this is the first immortal cell line in that they survive outside the body in perpetuity. Um, at the time, what the doctors did was considered legal, but now we would not consider it legal, we would consider it unethical. So this story is very disturbing and it is part of our history when we look back at some of the things we did in terms of ethics. But the good thing is that those healer cells for Henrietta Lacks have contributed hugely to science, Sci saved millions of people from a whole range of diseases, been used extensively in vaccine research and leukemia research and so on. Uh, so although she didn't know it at the time, her family have now agreed and they have a say in how those cells are being used because clearly it's their genetic material that's out there as well. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, I want to say thank you to all, you can, uh, probably millions of women have uh, participated in the many studies that have gone into vaccines and treatment and screening. Um, and uh, just to thank all the scientists and the clinicians, and I started with Lynn Denny as well. But um, for this talk in particular, I'd like to thank Sinead delaney Wereffle, who le is leading the HOPE study in the free state that I mentioned. Susie, who's here in the audience, and Gemma, who's a young uh, research assistant, Lynn Denny, Trudy Smith, and from many colleagues from WHO, including the uh, DG's expert group on cervical cancer and um, the HPV Single Dose Consortium. But I'd like to thank you all very much for your time. And I hope I took you through history and made sense of the three pots of what we have to do. Thank you very much. Good evening, we're coming through. Good evening, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Distinguished guests, all protocol observed. Um, my name, for those who don't know me, is Barry Shub. Um, I'm uh, once upon a time I used to work in this place uh, some years back. Uh, I'm now a veteran member of the Paleo Research Foundation, uh, and it's my great pleasure, privilege, honour to give a vote of thanks to our very distinguished and eminent presenter, Professor Evan Reese. Now, Helen and I actually go back, I think, many decades <laughs> from the start of the polio days and the vaccine days, right up to the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so I've really got to know Helen very, very well over these years. And um, some months ago, when I proposed to the Polio Research Foundation to invite Helen to give the, I think it's the 17th James Gear, a very important one because we also did the unveiling of the of the Royal Wiggle um, Museum. And again, to thank uh, Roy as well, I didn't have the opportunity when we un uh, unveiled the plaque. Um, and the board fortunately greeted my proposal with great alacrity. Um, and when I invited Helen and she agreed with even greater alacrity, I was absolutely delighted because Helen's, as, as uh, Caroline presented, there are enormous demands on her time. Uh, she's extremely busy, uh, and we really are so grateful that she did find the time to come and give us this lecture uh, in a very, very busy schedule. Now, um, Helen set a very high bar for the lecture, eliminating cervical cancer. Give us the tools and we'll eliminate it. And we'll uh, finish the job. Sorry, we'll finish the job. Um, and I think you'll all agree um, who is all of us, as well as those electronically connected, that she did a really outstanding job. She did a, This was a tour de force. Uh, on such an important public health issue as cervical cancer, she really showed us the roadmap so clearly, so articulately, and gave us the kind of 
optimism that the job can be finished uh, with the right tools. Uh, and I think this is so important for us as the Paleo Research Foundation to have had a lecture like this, where it'll kind of show us what virology can achieve. Um, some years back, we actually spoke about uh, another virus which can be controlled with with, uh, with vaccine, hepatitis B virus vaccine. And I remember similar discussions with the late Mark Q um, on using hepatitis B virus to control that very pernicious tumor, hepatoma, uh, liver cancer. And in fact, where hepatitis B vaccine has been used extensively, the incidence of liver cancer has dropped quite precipitously, in fact, in this country as well. So now it's a chance of hepatitis, of uh, human papilloma virus. Uh, and uh, it really was such a pleasure to such a uh, educational tour that you gave us uh, going through going through the, uh, uh, the ability of this virus to again uh, control a cancer. So again, Helen, thanks for giving us of your expertise, your profound expertise, your time, your very busy time uh, to come and give us this talk. Thank you very much. <clears throat> You want to come up, Helen? We just got a. On behalf of the PRF, just a token of our appreciation. Um, before we go next door for <clears throat> for refreshments, just a few words of thanks. Uh, first of all, Professor Adrian Purin, the director of the NICD, uh, for facilitating this, this meeting. <clears throat> then I hope she's... Oh, there she is. Uh, Irma. And Irma be, has been thanked already uh, this, after, this afternoon. But again, the indomitable Irma. Who, uh, and without Irma, nothing gets done. And with Irma, things get done so efficiently and, and uh, we really are grateful. Thank you very much for all you've done. Um, Sam and Gombazulu, I don't know if he's here. Are there, Sam? Sam, thanks very much for also looking after us and looking after the, the estate uh, and helping for this meeting as well. Um, Guy, for taking the pictures. Uh, bridge the gap for the, uh, just bridge the gap for the audiovisual. Uh, Sina from the communication department. I hope I haven't left anybody out. <clears throat> of course, the Paleo Research Foundation, Mr. Uh, Alistair Moffat, and our new chairman, Mr. Dal Wood, who well, is you know, presumably somewhere here, uh, for also sponsoring this evening and sponsoring refreshments, which will be in the seminar room, not at the back there because of the rain, but in the seminar room. So please join us uh, for some light refreshments. And thank you very much, everybody, for coming and for those who are linked as well for attending this lecture.